السلام عليكم هني وعافية أول شيء I hope everyone has uh, had a great iftar and uh, gathered a lot of stickers as, as many as possible how many has how many of you have like four stickers or more by raise of hands all right three or more okay two or more one or more anyone here didn't get any stickers so far all right so i'm not the only one who doesn't have any stickers but i'm very delighted to be here with you and uh, special thanks to wiperus and muslet for this lovely invitation my name is haya seer and i'm the senior projects lead at the arab youth center and i'm joined here by our by our amazing colleagues from the youth climate champion team zan fernando i'll leave it to yourself to uh, introduce uh, yourself to the uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for having us. The food was incredible. Uh, and I'm sorry that we're interrupting this amazing food and sort of keep keep going. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. My name is Fernando Armendariz. I am a program manager with the Youth Climate Champion team. I'm originally from Ecuador. Um, anybody know the capital city? Who can say it first? Quito, over there. Where's the price? No, no price. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so I joined the, the Youth Climate Champion team a couple of months ago. Before this role, I was working at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., working on issues related to resilience in the urban development sector and in the water and sanitation sector. And uh, yeah, I also was kind of working a little bit on youth empowerment. And really, this job was the perfect opportunity to, to combine both youth empowerment and climate change resilience. So very happy to be here. Thank you. Zan? Would you give us a, a quick introduction on your previous work? Um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, and again, thank you so much for having me here. Just moved to the UAE about five or six weeks ago and I've been learning all about your amazing culture and food. And it's like, yeah, absolutely incredible. That food was delicious. Um, but I'm Zan from London in the UK and I've worked for several years trying to empower young people um, in education and politics, and then particularly started focusing on climate change since it's really the issue that young people more than anyone are going to have to handle for many, many years to come in the future. And so I joined the youth constituency to United Nations Climate Change Convention. The last few years was working with youth NGOs and activist groups to be involved in climate negotiations and just made the move to come over here because I'm really excited about the UAE's vision for the COP this year and the youth champion role and a lot of exciting things are gonna be happening. Thank you, Zan. We're excited to have you here uh, too. Um, I mean, if you are at this floor today, then you have worked or you're currently working in the fields of sustainability, renewable energy, climate change. How many of you, I'm just curious to know, how many of you attended COP27? One, two, three, four, five. With the raise of hand, how many of you are planning to be part of COP28? Everyone raise your hands. Everyone raise your hands. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, COP28 is coming to the UAE this year, and it's no surprise that this is also our year of sustainability, where there are a lot of initiatives and projects that have been carried out and highlighted in the field of sustainability and climate change. We're going to dive, take a dip, a dive today with the Youth Climate Champion team. And just to give an overview, every year the host country of the COP announces a COP presidency. The COP presidency usually has a, a president delegate, designate and a high level champion. This year, the UAE has announced the first Youth Climate Champion, Her Excellency Shamal Mazrouri, as her capacity as YCC, she has a brilliant team and they're planning so many youth involvements for COP28. Today, we're going to listen a bit about the strategy and how can we be involved. But first, allow me to ask everyone to face us. So especially the first two tables, I'm going to ask you to face us before we start the, the session. Bad. <laughs> So Fernando, let's start with you. Uh, you're part of the YCC team and um, you have launched the road to, to COP28 recently in March 15. Would you kindly let us know a bit more about what you're calling the PAVE strategy? Yeah, so first of all, who attended the, the road to COP um, event in Dubai? 
show of hands great amazing uh, yeah so essentially we know that uh, young people are doing incredible work around climate change uh, but they're not necessarily always part of climate negotiations and climate change policy making and we also know that young people are going to be the most affected by climate change because of a uh, unpredictable future with uh, extreme weather events and it's because of this that we the the COP28 presidency in the UAE understood that it was important to have someone rallying behind young people um, who really made sure they were included in the UNFCCC negotiation process in COP28. And this is really the impetus for, for establishing the, the youth climate champion role and designating in Her Excellency Shamma al Masri, as you mentioned, um, as the youth climate champion. So first of all, I have to say before I keep going that I'm very inspired by, by everyone here. I was telling someone that when I was people, you know, when I was the age of many people here, I was just playing tennis and not worrying about anything. But uh, in my different engagements, I've seen many of you um, time and time again doing incredible things. So it's it's really inspiring to be in the presence of all of you. Um, but that being said, the work that we're doing as the Youth Climate Champion is falls under four pillars um, called PAVE, as you rightly mentioned. And, you know, we all love our acronyms. So I'm going to try to to make you guess at first, what does the P stand for? Think about youth engagement, climate change. So what does P stand for? Any guesses? P, P, no. Participation. <laughs> so we know that, um, as I mentioned, not a lot of people, not a lot of young people are um, mainstream in the climate change negotiations, uh, fully participating. So the P stands for participation. So how, how do we make sure that young people can attend COP um, that includes from a badging perspective, from a cost perspective. I mean, there's a lot of barriers that prevent people from joining COP. Um, but also, how do we make sure that, you know, people are in the, the places they need to be, not only as observers, but also right there at the negotiation table uh, because their perspectives are incredibly valuable and they're also affected by climate change. The A stands for? A stands for? Climate. There we go. There you go. My favorite movie genre. Action. So we know that many people around the world, including many of you or all of you, are doing incredible work around climate change. So it's really how do you how do you amplify the efforts? How do you show showcase every amazing work that's being done? So that's gonna include, you know, making sure that what I mean what people are doing is showcased at COP, that uh there's you know, ways that we can continue encouraging people to take uh, climate action through through various ways. Then uh, the V stands for? V stands for? Adele has an incredible voice. There you go. So <laughs> as I mentioned, um, often young people are not really listened to. Um, they're not fully considered. And uh, voice is really going to be all about elevating young people's voices from around the world making sure that they are heard, making sure that their voices are part of, um, of COP28. And that includes, again, you know, from a logistical point of view, but also making sure that whatever is negotiated considers, for example, the global youth statement and making sure that, yeah, that young people's perspectives and, and their voices are considered. And then the last one, E, stands for education. Ding, ding, ding. Very good. So we also know that it's really important to continue raising awareness about climate change. So that means how do we equip young people with the knowledge and resources uh, that they need to carry on um, climate change, all the, the climate action uh, that's very much needed. So anyways, PAVE, participation, action, voice, and education. And we can then talk about some of the activities under those. But Yes, so amazing. So you have this amazing strategy. If we are to translate this strategy into projects and initiatives, how are you seeing this on 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 the various levels? If you can, yeah, thank you so much. So, um, so I'm proud to say that we have a lot of activities at the local, regional, and global level that fall under all these four pillars. So, to give you a couple of examples, um, in the the March 15 event, we launched the International Youth Climate Delegate Program. So as I mentioned, a lot of people have many barriers to attend COP and uh, the COP28 presidency is launching, launched a program um, to fully fund 100 uh, young delegates to attend COP. That includes uh, 
strong priority for people coming from least developed countries and small island development states, as well as other minority groups that commonly have the, the biggest barriers to attend COP. Uh, we're also having a strong priority for people with disabilities. And again, really understanding that it's the voices of those most excluded that really need to be here. And um, so that's certainly under participation. Um, and then to give you another example under voice, we are conducting global consultations, basically trying to go to as many places as possible to get to hear from young people what their priorities are, what their challenges are, what they hope to see from COP28, and making sure that their voices are shaping the COP28 agenda. So that's under um, that's under voice. And anyways, I just want to mention a couple of those. And we're also, of course, collaborating with Arab Youth Center, which you're a part of. Uh, yeah, having a local delegate program. I know some of you are here as well, but yeah. So thank you for mentioning. Uh, we're also working on different initiatives to raise awareness, promote action uh, for up to COP28. Uh, Zan, if I move the next question to you, you have been part of COP26, you've been part of COP27, and now you're part of uh, the team that's strategizing how youth are involved in COP28. Can you tell us more, how do you think this strategy would reflect on youth, not only within the local context, but also the regional and international youth in general? How are they benefiting from this? Yeah, well, I think it's going to be an incredibly exciting year, and it's been increasing exponentially, actually, the youth climate movement each year. I'm sure all of you have noticed it. I mean, the COP couldn't be a more critical, critical moment for mankind. Decisions made at the COP become binding international law for every country in the world. Every single little text and detail matters. And yet for the first decade or so, young people were just completely excluded from that process entirely. Uh, eventually, youth organizations started mobilizing independently ahead of COP, saying, well, if you don't let us in, we're going to come up with our own ideas, our own plans and projects. And the momentum has built and built and built. It was eventually back in 2011 that the UN formally allowed a youth constituency uh, as part of the COP process, as a platform for youth NGOs and businesses and activist projects to finally have some voice in the negotiations there. And uh, I can promise you when you're in the COP negotiation rooms, it makes a huge difference if you have a group of people discussing an item and there's one young person there who can say, I'm the one who's actually going to inherit the effects of the catastrophic things you're talking about. And I have an innovative idea of how you can move things forward here. It completely changes the scene. It brings things forward. It opens things up. But even in the 10 years or so that these youth platforms have been there, Still, the participation and access has been nowhere near adequate. Usually, young people have to find their own way to scramble to get to COP. Um, they have to spend all of their savings. Usually, they're you know sleeping on the floor, on people's couches. And then they get into the rooms. They don't have any information about what happens. They get excluded from the most important discussions. And so, really, it's been a, a frankly inequitable process at COP for many, many years. But this has slowly been changing. And there were some quite landmark decisions at COP27 last year. We had every single country in the world agree that young people need to be at the forefront of climate discussions locally, nationally, and internationally. And we even had an agreement that young people need to be included in national delegations. And the UAE has clearly heard and taken on this call and is stepping up itself by appointing the youth climate champion, by including young people in their own delegation, and I think you're going to see a huge amount of uh, resources and energy uh, invested in creating a really good space for young people this year. So I think this year there's going to be more young people than there's ever been. There's going to be more opportunities to talk to negotiators. There's going to be huge amounts of important policy open on the table where you can input. And I think internationally you're seeing people rally uh, in response to this as well. Uh, just before the COP, young people self-organize what's known as the COI, the Conference of Youth, where young people finalize their own desired agenda items and policy outputs from the COP. And now it's uh, just naturally grown this process where each country around the world has their own national level Conference of Youth to create their own set of targets as young people within each country. And then that feeds into regional summits as well. I think last year we had almost uh, 80 countries 
that had what we call an ELCOI, a, a, a national summit to prepare. And every single region in the world had a regional COI, which all felt fed into the global COI and the global youth statement that had a really strong impact on the decision makers at COP last year. And so the momentum is building, every country is mobilizing. And I think if all of you step up, you'll have the chance to influence things as well. We're very hopeful that everyone in this room will be crucial part of youth involvement uh, in the upcoming COI and COP. Just to recap a bit, um, what is Co COP? What does COP stand for? Conference of Parties. What is the main or one of the most important parts of COP? Negotiations. Amazing. Okay. What are the thematic pillars in negotiations? The questions are getting harder. Adaptation, mitigation, what else? Loss and damage, nice, what else? Finance, green finance. All right, so there are uh, several thematics in which negotiators follow on e every single year, and we cannot deep, uh, dive deep into all of them uh, today, but let's take an example of one uh, thematic area, and that is adaptation. Uh, Fernando, can you tell us a bit more what is adaptation? And um, maybe if you can give us a few examples. Yeah, sounds great. So um, adaptation basically means that we're going to have to start um, adjusting or modifying or fine tuning our systems, um, our economy, our, you know, different structures to actual or predicted uh, climate risks, shocks and stresses. So essentially, we know that the, you know, we're already experiencing the, the effects of climate change. We know that uh, weather events are more erratic, weather events are more disruptive. Um, we see, for example, uh, in 2022, we saw 30 million people displaced because of flooding in Pakistan that covered a third of the country, right? We saw uh, droughts that in the past 50 years have uh, led to 500,000 deaths in Africa, for example. So we know that we're experiencing things and we're going to continue experiencing things. So it's really the, the need to, to adapt <laughs> to use the same word, to adjust to, to what's happening and what's to come. And um, I, as I mentioned before, joining the Youth Climate Champion team, I, I worked for the World Bank for many years and I had the chance to, to work on, on teams that were assessing resilience and, and preparedness of different countries. And uh, just to give you an example, we were in, in, in a city called Diredawa in Ethiopia. And who can tell you the name of the capital city of Ethiopia? Addis Ababa, very good. I like. You're on the roll today. Yeah, on the roll. We need a prize for him. I don't know. Prize. Here. Um, but yeah, so we were in Dida Dawa, um, and it's uh, you know, they took us on a field study, and we got to this place that was incredibly, incredibly dry, but it had huge walls uh, on both sides, and we saw a lot of activity. We saw a market. We saw people running around. We saw children playing, and then they told us that actually this very dry land used to be a river. And that they had, um, but when it rained, essentially, uh, well, first of all, the, because of drought, the water all dried up. But um, when it rains, not even there, but upstream, the water comes at such high velocity and there's basically no absorption because it's so in such state of the certification that it creates flash floods. And a lot of those people that are in markets or even sleep in there are washed away and tragically leads to, to a lot of um, damages. So those retaining walls are an example of adaptation because they're trying to, you know, prevent the flooding from getting to, to either place. Um, so that's, that's an example. But I also think that um, like that, there's, there's many others. You can have early warning systems that alert people, you know, there's, um, yeah, I mean, I think information is, is a really good, um, yeah, it's a really good example of adaptation. We know that there was a very strong cyclone that devastated a lot of parts in Africa, for example. So if you have more robust early warning systems, you can prevent um, casualties. You can prevent um, yeah, people from getting hurt. And, um, and I know we're going to keep talking about adaptation in a second, but I do have to say that, um, you know, another very quick example. Uh, I worked in Indonesia and, uh, you know, if you go to the northern part of the capital city of Indonesia, Nobody? Capital city of Indonesia? 
There you go, Jakarta. It's okay. It's okay. We were looking at you. Um, very good. So uh, essentially, in Jakarta, which is a city with many, many millions of people, if you go to the northern coast of Jakarta, it's sinking at a very, very fast rate. So if you can look at uh, pictures where you have, you know, they've also implemented an adaptation measures. So you have a seawall, but the city is sinking at such pass, fast pace that if you look at pictures, the sea, so the sea is here and the city is down here. So essentially without those seawalls, the city would completely get destroyed, right? But the sea level is going to continue to, I mean, sea is going to continue to rise, right? So what I'm and and right now, basically, many of you may know that the capital city of Jakarta is moving to another place. So it's not going to be Jakarta anymore. This is because the city can no longer accommodate uh, more people moving in. And then you're also exacerbating all that stress with sea level rise and, and increased flooding, etc. So while, you know, perhaps if you keep putting the wall higher and higher and higher, that's an adaptation measure. But really, you also need to look at mitigation. And you really need, you know, when you're looking at climate change, you really need to consider a lot of different uh, matters because adaptation alone is not going to cut it. You know, if it continues to rain, if the weather continues to be erratic, um, then it's just, uh, yeah, it's a not sustainable solution. Adaptation and, and mitigations are going a lot hand in hand together. But to see an entire country change its capital, that's huge. Um, and... I know that the talk might get a bit technical here, but if we are to understand the overall arching umbrella of how are these themes integrated in the COP processes and, um, and how are youth involved in them? Yeah, it's a great question. These are sort of very sort of physical, tangible issues. And then loads of people in suits get together a COP and talk for a long time what, uh, what actually happens. Um, be prepared if, you, if you're going to be there at COP. It doesn't look like how you see in a nice movie at the UN where everyone's sort of friendly, like, oh, great idea, let's do that. It's more like if you're sort of down at the souk and haggling for a price and it's getting very heated and aggressive. You haven't had much food or water. No one's getting any sleep. It's really intense. And when you get to adaptation, it becomes very, very personal, actually. Um, you know, on the mitigation side, I think everyone sort of agrees, like, yes, we need to transition our energy. But, you know, if the lights here are being powered by sort of oil versus electric power, you know, you're not going to, or uh, wind uh, power, sorry, you're not going to notice it straight away. If you have a tsunami coming towards your house and there's either a wall there to protect you or not, that's, it's very, very personal. And uh, it's a sad case that the countries who have contributed the least to global emissions are the ones who are being most devastated by the kind of things that Fernando is talking about. Um countries in the Pacific, the least developed countries, they produce a tiny fraction of emissions, but uh, they're facing all the consequences. And so when it comes to COP, um, they're really trying to set the major global targets on how we're going to deal with these issues. And the finance is obviously a critical element of that, because obviously it's not fair for each country to only pay for, uh, you know, to build all the infrastructure itself if they're not causing any emissions, but they're facing all the consequences. So it becomes very difficult. And uh, actually, adaptation has been a bit of a sort of black hole in the negotiation space for a while because it's not properly covered in the Paris Agreement. Does anyone who, who here knows the Paris Agreement? Who's heard of the, the, the Paris Climate Agreement? Some of you. Who can tell me what, what does it say in one sentence? What is the agreement? 1.5. Okay, yeah basically limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, and so that's all on the mitigation side, right? That's all just about cutting emissions to try and meet that goal. Um, so the Paris Agreement was a huge landmark breakthrough on the mitigation side, but on adaptation, they got nowhere near as far. They basically agreed, similar to the 1.5 goal in mitigation, we need a global goal on adaptation as well. But they didn't agree uh, what that goal is. They didn't even, yeah, it wasn't sort of framed in any way at all, basically. They just said, we agree to have a goal of some kind. And so for five years now, they've still been debating what that goal is going to look like. And that's still going on and on. And for the past two years now, there's been what we call uh, a two-year work program on the global goal and adaptation. And we're really hoping that this is finally going to be the year when we set a clear goal uh, for how to address adaptation and that will include who's going to be paying for the costs, 
there's already meant to be a target for a hundred billion a year being invested in adaptation uh, technology and infrastructure. So far, it's only reached about 40 billion or so. So it's way behind on finance. It's got to think about education. Yeah, even you know, a country like here in the UAE, you're quite well adapted already, but still it's going to keep getting hotter. It could affect food and water supply. People need the knowledge and education of how to handle this, how to be prepared. And so there's a huge amount that's going to be up for debate. And uh, young people, if you get involved in the COI, in the local COIs, uh, Hire's team is going to be really active, I think, in organizing um, some of the regional COI efforts. And uh, you can feed in your opinions there. Those will go into the global use statements, which are heard by the negotiators. You can try and get access to the COP through uh, one of your organizations or initiatives and join the negotiations. Uh, you can try and get in touch with us in one of the global consultations that we're doing, and we'll see what we can do on our side. And we're hoping that the global goal and adaptation will have a really strong component on how it's going to help young people, how young people can be included in adaptation conversations, how we're going to bring education to young people so that everyone can understand this without being lucky enough to, you know, come to an amazing iftar like this and, and hearing a speech. This should be things that everyone is able to know about very easily. So yeah, that's going to be some of the things on the adaptation agenda this year and encourage you to get involved. So much effort, uh, so, so much pressure is on uh, the agenda this year and uh, COP28 is promising to deliver a lot on different sides. And I know we're running out of time, but I promise that we're going to take a few questions from the audience. So I would be eager to hear if you have any questions and inquiries, especially from the tables at the back. We didn't hear you today. I don't know. I know we don't have much time. And while I grab my notebook, um, um, with a show of hand, if you have any questions, please do raise your hand. Okay. Um, the lady at the back. Yes. And also what? Yes, yeah, sorry. One thing. Also, when if you also have just examples of what you think could be a good adaptation measure. I think that would be good to test your knowledge of what we've been sharing. If you can please introduce yourself and then. Uh, hi, I am uh, Sejo Farid Abdullah and uh, from um, this year, SA for Sustainability Ambassadors for 2023. I have a question about COP28. I um, Previously, I made a search about uh, COP28 and there was like, a good information is about that, but I have a doubt. What are the most important, how should I say, problems you're going to discuss and focus on in COP28 so that we can search more about this uh, thing? Thank you so much for, for that um, question. So from our side, I think we're biased. Youth. You know, how do we make sure youth is involved and uh, youth are empowered? But um, actually, this COP is going to be very critical because um, of the global stock take. But before that, does anyone know anything about loss and damage? Have you heard of loss and damage? Yeah? Okay. Somebody said it before. That's right. Um, so the announcement about loss and damage is, you know, essentially having uh, funding for for countries that are affected the most by um, climate change. So that was announced in COP27 in Egypt, but then really figuring out how that's going to be implemented, that's going to be one of the the agenda items uh, for COP28. But then there's also this global stock take. So as, as Anne mentioned you know, in, the, in the COP in Paris, where the Paris agreements came into effect, um, well, this year, the global stock take is going to essentially take a look back and see where we stand the progress that we've made towards the, the goal established in Paris and really figure out uh, priorities moving forward. So I really encourage you um, who asked the question and everyone here to start, um, yeah, doing a little bit of research about loss and damage, about the global stock take. And when you see this very important, um, you know, themes that are being discussed, really think about how you can be involved as a young person. And, uh, you know, we mentioned there's going to be global consultations. There's going to be uh, regional COIs and local COIs. And so really don't be afraid and saying, you know, I don't know about this very much. Like you are impacted by climate change, you know, people that are impacted by climate change. So please make sure that you participate in everything. So that's. 
I'll just add quickly. Uh, well, I'll give you a sneak a sneak preview of the results of the global stock take. It's not looking good. Uh, we're not on track by any means or any measure to meet the Paris Agreement targets. And on mitigation last year, uh, there really wasn't any progress made. It became very tense and aggressive the last few days of COP27. And so mitigation, there's going to be a huge amount of work to be done. We've just talked a lot about the global goal on adaptation, finance. Finance is going to be absolutely critical. It's becoming more and more clear. To, you know, Fernando was just saying Indonesia needs to move its entire capital city. Just imagine the costs. Pakistan last year cost 30 billion just from one flooding event. Um, so finance is really critical. I just want to also mention there's a negotiation track called ACE. Don't ask me why the UN has all these complicated acronyms. No one understands it. Um, but ACE stands for Action for Climate Empowerment. And that included in there is climate education, training, awareness, and public engagement. And it falls under there how young people can get involved. And so keep a lookout for ACE as well. There was a big agreement on this last year called the ACE Action Plan. But we're all going to be checking very carefully this year how countries are implementing this. And I think for us as young people, education is its really important. You know, we've just been through education ourselves. Um, we really need to be, I think, at the forefront of those conversations. How does education need to change and adapt? So if you're interested in that topic, it'll be a good year for that. So. Hello, everyone. This is Mohammed, and this is my colleague, Tariq Al-Asad. Uh, he's from the People's Determination. He has a hearing impairment. However, he's really dedicated to climate change, and he would like to ask a question regarding the speech that was given. So just bear with me while we are translating the question. We as a youth, what can we do in the upcoming few months in order to be fully prepared to take part in COP28. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Pramit, for being here and for asking this question. And I wish I've learned a bit of Thai language to be able to understand uh, firsthand. But I think this is a very essential uh, question. And I'll leave it to you, Zan and Fernando, to answer how can youth be more involved? This one. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for for that um, incredible question. And I think that the, yeah, I mean, just in terms of inclusion, we know that it's important to include everyone's um, opinion. So that's why, as part of the delegate program, we're also making sure that people of determination are part of it because their voices also and their messages uh, deserve to be heard. Um, now, in terms of how you can get uh, prepared. I would say um, look out for a lot of different initiatives that um, Her Excellency Shama al Masrui will be announcing on her social media. So as I mentioned, the, the Youth Climate Delegate Program was, was launched. Uh, unfortunately, the applications closed um, last Friday, but that was just one of, uh, yeah, it was one of the many initiatives that are being organized. Like we mentioned, there's, there's a lot going on at the local, um, regional, and global level. So you can certainly get involved by, um, yeah, by participating in the regional COI, the different local um, COIs. There's going to be also the general COI. Uh, you can certainly also go to the green zone um, during COP itself, which is an opportunity, you know, everyone can can access it. And I do have to say, you know, it's, it's important for people to learn about COP and the different thematics. And we know that a lot of these resources are not always uh, very accessible. And that is something that we're very, very um, aware of at the Youth Climate Champion uh, team, the the need for people to understand COP because like my colleagues Anne mentioned, people get to COP and they don't know what's going on. So yeah, your question is just another reminder that um, we need to do better in terms of making sure that people really understand COP because that's really going to prepare young people to be um, a part of that as well. Thank you, Fernando. Thank I just, oh, can I, I'm sorry. Just an important uh task I would actually put back to you is, you know, if you were thinking about how can I make an impact at COP and be prepared, think about what do you want from COP? What do you want to focus on? What do you really care about? Climate change is a huge topic and COP is a huge chaotic space. There's going to be probably 80,000 people there. Everyone has a different agenda trying to do a different thing. 
So it's good to have a really deep think over the next couple of months while you have some time. Get a feel what's going to be negotiated at the COP, what else is going to be happening, what is relevant to me, where can I make a difference, and try and choose a really sort of specific target for yourself to work on. If you want to get on the policy side, you'll have a lot more effect if you choose one policy track and really educate yourself on that. So when you go to the experts at COP, you can speak with some knowledge and, and sort of really wow them and say, you know, this specific change to the policy you're working on right now could have a huge impact. Then it's likely to have a really big effect. And um, yeah, as Fernando said, we'll be doing our best to try and make information and capacity building a lot more available. It hasn't been easy to get in years in the past, but hopefully we'll do best, do better on that. Um, you'll be able to contact us if there's anything more we can do. And yeah, the, the local COIs, the regional COIs are an amazing way um, to start shaping your ideas, to influence your own government, who at the end of the day is the one probably most likely to listen to your voice. And so yeah, start. Uh, don't wait for someone to tell you how to do everything. You also need to start working and make your best to make this a year where you achieve something impactful. Can yes. just give that under her plus to our speaker? Can I just take 10 seconds? I promise I won't take more. Five seconds. Five seconds. <laughs> yeah. So everyone thinks that you need to be an economist or an engineer to be, you know, to be involved in climate action. And I would say we need artists, sports people, just everyone needs to join in. So if your passion is art to convey your need for climate change through art, through spoken word, through whatever, please just get involved. We need you. That's it. Please give that Thank you so much. Our speaker. Thank you, Shefa. Thank you, Zan, Fernando. Thank you for everyone for attending. Special thanks to Wiperus and Musler for hosting this. You can connect with us on LinkedIn if you have any more questions.